Welcome everybody to this latest episode of Really Dicey. And we are honored with the presence of Rick Hines, who's putting together this amazing Kickstarter from Apotheosis Studios, um, the Red Opera. And uh, I'm very excited to talk to you about it because it looks fantastic. Um, so tell us about this. What is the Red Opera? Okay, so um, the Red Opera, Last Days of the Warlock, is this crazy freaking brainchild that we had where we were going to take uh, the Heavy Metal Hall of Fame, uh, the band Dia Morte's like, uh, metal show that they do, and the Budapest Scoring Symphonic Orchestra, put together all of this music into like this full symphony, and then write a full 5E uh, campaign uh, based off this for high tier play. The whole concept is warlocks are like a really underserved uh, feature in in tabletop D D, you know, the play there. They're a really popular class, but there's not a lot of books uh, out there, and we really wanted to find a way to support player agency storytellers and um, you know players with full immersion into an actual like campaign setting that you could run in any kind of world or campaign. So the 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 plot of it, I so supposed to say, is this is a place where the veil between worlds runs thin. It's set in a northern territory, a metropolitan and cosmopolitan city where everybody from different planes and different walks of life kind of coalesce into this spot where the accursed king sits on the throne and he has the ability to cut patron packs with every patron that's out there. And after so much time of doing this and for so long, his sanity is starting to get a bit in question. One too many deals might have gone just a little bit awry. And so the Red Opera, it, The Last Days of the Warlock, opens up with the signs that the king is starting to lose his mind. And what follows is a tragic opera where the players will get to determine the final fate of the Shadelands. And even if you're a warlock or if you're not a warlock, everybody here can cut deals with patrons. And you'll get to determine whether or not the Shadelands you know, warlocks thrive, whether warlocks, you know, get obliterated here, uh, you want to burn the place to the ground, you want to become the king, whatever will happen, there will be some aspect of multiple choice endings. But while you're playing through this, you'll get access to like a full symphony that we had composed. It's very metal inspired. It is, you know, definitely playing up a lot of very old school themes around music, operas, uh, you know, that old satanic panic that happened back in the day with cutting deals and those gray, <laughs> mor gray moral choices of what will you do for your own success or power and how much are you willing to pay for that price? Wow. No, sounds good. Sounds good. So my first question is, um, why warlocks? What, what, um, why warlocks? Because out of all, run you to warlocks. Uh, all of the Dungeons and Dragons classes, uh, barbarians and warlocks are probably the two most metal uh, classes that okay, you could possibly sure. have. And considering that the band's original uh, uh, album, the the just titled the Red Opera, uh, was based about this tale of of two like a divided kingdom continually engaging in an arms race with supernatural ethereal forces it naturally lent itself right to Warlocks. And since I've been writing for Geek and Sundry for a few years, and I've been writing on a lot of other projects, I went and I took a look and I found that there's cities run by paladins. There's great cities in, in Dungeons and Dragons run by wizards. You know, clerics have plenty of shining because Warlocks were sort of like a supplementary class added on in one of the, the additions. They've never really gotten a full lore treatment where here is a place where Warlocks run the show. And so it was kind of like a triple, uh, triple threat. One, uh, it's, it's an underserved content. Two, it fit the original sort of material. They're metal as hell. And <laughs> also the relationship between patrons and warlocks is fun role-playing opportunity. And so I can go ahead and say, okay, cool. Everybody, even if you're not a warlock, can go ahead and engage with that that, that deal, that back and forth for a temporary power as you, you know, sell your soul or you're the cunning bastard who has achieved, <laughs> uh, you know, a clever deal and pulled one over on a patron. Well, so, so you clearly don't all have to be warlocks. No, no, not at all. Um, and the, 
one of the, the one of the the live streams that we we've run, we had a, a no warlocks in the party, and the other one it was all warlocks. And okay. you know, there's people come to it in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, when you're a storyteller and you're at a table and you have uh, five players, and one of them is a warlock and the rest of the party isn't, the reason that patron warlock relationship often gets pushed to the side is you would have to take that player, run a special side scene for them to the exclusion of everybody else at the table. Right. So we think it's a really cool concept, obviously. We love <laughs> uh, that, that dynamic. So by allowing the patrons to talk to everybody uh, and offer temporary power, uh, it, it means that you can play that up even if you're not a warlock and everybody will get to experience what their party members go through. And maybe at the end, they might have some sympathy for their, their, their <laughs> warlock brethren who find themselves burdened with power and favors and debts old. So, uh, let's talk a bit about you know, the Kickstarter. I know it's not Kickstarter. What, 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 um, what rewards, what am I, what am I getting if I were to help kickstart this? What would someone get out of it? So, um, you know, we have a bunch of different tiers, obviously, like most Kickstarters. And the basic digital tier, I mean, you know, a lot of people just run by buying the PDFs and things like that. You back that part, you're going to get a full campaign that's 10x, it's uh, 95,000 words. Uh, the actual setting of the Shadelands that you can plug into your existing campaign setting. And inside the Adventure Axe itself, there's a QR code that you just simply scan with your phone um, or, you know, even on your computer, you can just do the quick screen grab, pull it up, and you'll actually be linked to the full orchestral symphony uh, from the, that uh, Diamorte had put together. So no matter what, even at the basic tier, you're getting that uh, like a cool making of, because the art that Apotheosis Studios had managed to put together is out of this freaking world. It's gorgeous. If nothing else, just check out the Kickstarter page because everybody who's seen that has been like, this thing is crazy. Beyond that, we get, you know, the, the physical book, which is, you know, this hardcover, you know, I mean, I think we might be, if our stretch goals are unlocked, we might be pushing over 250, 300 pages, you know, along with a, a bunch of stuff in there. And, you know, then there's like the special edition and, you know, you, that's obviously like the cool, like with the foil cases and everything like that. But the real fun tiers are, um, we have a bunch of like treasure hoard add-ons because we've partnered with Level Up Dice to create a set of like four D10 like metal Eldritch Blast dice. Because I'm I'm tired of every Kickstarter offering a dice set and it's one of every single dice. I'm like, no, nah, <laughs> screw that. I want four D10s for my Eldritch Blast. Um, <laughs> we we have a uh, partner with Initiative Coffee to make a freaking uh, coffee uh, that you can. <laughs> You can get because that coffee's fucking metal, and I wanted that death clock meme to be real, right? Sure. Um, and uh, you know, but we have you know custom minis. We have uh, like GM advantage tokens, like coins so that, that are actually the mint printed or the minted metal coins for uh, like you know advantage hand your players. But they're also the in-game currency. But then lastly, we have two tiers that are they're they're pricey. Not gonna lie, but they're pricey because they require work. And what they are is uh, margin and patron. And you will, if you back those tiers, we will end up crafting your character in the Shadelands and write a full side quest with like five custom art pieces uh, wow. as well featured around your character. Because the way our adventure is structured, there's the 10 main plot beat acts, but after those, there's the potential for three side quests that we kind of list out. So the players can cut and weave and choose their own paths through and, you know, support multiple playthroughs to, you know, really kind of embrace player agency. I will, I will go on uh, a battlefield and die on the flag of player agency. I, <laughs> I, I, I believe in it so much, but we will take one and we will take your character and we will weave and we'll work with you to put yourself in uh, the Red Opera. And so if you want to like have a hand in, you know, you have a favorite gaming group, you have a favorite warlock that you've done, you could bring wickedness into this, uh, this campaign. <laughs> and we have a team of writers and artists that are, that are on board to help bring people's visions to life too. Wow. <laughs> that sounds pretty extensive. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, uh, 
you know, year, years of uh, covering Geek and Sundry and covering a lot of Kickstarters, I've, I've sort of learned like, hey, this is this is what we can do. And uh, Apotheosis uh, Studios, uh, the, the CEO there, Jameson, he's been studying and like taking all of the advice from everybody. We've been asking everybody who's ever done a Kickstarter. And the one thing that <laughs> nobody ever tells you about is that like stress that happens when you start actually launching and it's like everything goes up and then it plateaus goes like this way and you're like ah! <laughs> you know panic um you know it doesn't matter how many times people tell you that that's gonna happen it's still sure. when it still hits you you go oh, crap. yeah yeah sure I'm sure but yeah the, the 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 book is beautiful it um it's already written it's already laid out uh it's already you know done uh we did we did everything before we went to the kickstarter itself so this isn't one of those uh, projects where you go back it and then you have to wait two years uh, for for the book to come out. All yeah. we're going to do is finish up stretch goals and then we're going to go up to the printers. Nice, nice. So um, I wanted to talk briefly about the uh, the soundtrack, the Red Opera, right? The, yes. The, the heavy metal opera. So uh, I was listening to that some of some of that online, and uh, it it yeah, it's 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 a heavy metal opera. <laughs> Uh, it's beautiful and uh, you know metal in in, in places. Um, how do you envision people using that at the table? So the um, there's there, there's the original album which is has the vocals and the lyrics and is totally metal, right? That right. one we do not expect you to use that at the table. That would kill ah. any any scene um, because like you'd be sitting there storytelling and then Drake's on stage, like, you know, Duh! you know, like it's just not going to work. That is what I was wondering about. Cause I was, that's the one I found on YouTube. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, that, <laughs> that's the original album. And I mean, you can get that in with the book that, but that's not what comes inside the book um, okay. on the Kickstarter page itself. There's actually sample musics of the, uh, orchestral version with no lyrics and it's a, wow. a, a symphony version um, that has been remixed and remastered to um, basically be extended as well mm -hmm. to allow a storyteller to basically play this on repeat in the background and I think it comes out to like over like an hour and a half two hours long um, and you can either play it like one one song per per story or use it for your epic moments but that it, that's the one we intend for you to use. I actually did a stream last night on Geekly, or not Geekly, um, uh, Gehenna Gaming, uh, where they played that in the background while we were doing the stream. Nice, nice. So. Okay, that's that's good. I'm glad to hear that. All right. So Sounds good. I have to ask, what what are your inspirations be like? What what were the inspirations behind the creation of, 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 of the Red Opera? Were you, I mean, I, I keep thinking, I mean, Matt and I were talking before, like we kept thinking of Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, a lot of his works. Uh, what, what, were your, what, what, was, what were your inspirations behind it? What can, what can players expect when they open the book? Uh, I love Diablo. I played a ton of Diablo and I loved Baldur's Gate, uh, like the original like RPGs. I, I write as a novelist, urban fantasy anyway. So I always play with a lot of like myths and role choice. I come from a background of storytelling in White Wolf systems. So like Vampire the Masquerades, Wraith the Oblivion. I've run a lot of Deadlands. So it's a lot of these game systems where there is no such thing as alignments of like lawful good, lawful, you know, evil and whatnot, where everybody has, has a choice and you're in this sort of uh, just this setting that has a vibrant life because it's real. Not everybody is, is cut from these, you know, iconic, you know, DC hero cloths, you know, it's, it's more like that, but my inspirations are definitely Diablo, uh, freaking Ravenloft. Um, if I if if I could have legally said that like Ravenloft was a big inspiration, I totally would have put it on there. <laughs> um, uh, I, I need somebody to write a blurb for that so I could throw it into the book. Um, but um, but yeah, so those are, are are kind of those themes. And from the band when they wrote and created the the the, the first musical and and their first stage show. Uh, their inspirations were, again, kind of very similar in line to mine. They were from like Vampire the Masquerade, sort of these old classic uh, Romeo and Juliet-esque uh, mm -hmm. tales, uh, this very tragic uh, operas that happened uh, where everybody at the end dies 
that's not a spoiler. It's just <laughs> one potential outcome. Uh, you know, uh, players can intervene. Uh, and that was actually really fun when I had to go to the band and I was like, cool, we have this thing. I have to rewrite all of this lore because we have to have player, <laughs> player choice. Um, but, you know, they, they draw from the same, sort of the same pool of, of, of mind think on that we all grew up listening to you know, the, uh, metal music or, you know, hearing these tales and keep watching Lord of the Rings. But I would say for me, Diablo and Ravenloft and like my past experience of storytelling, like White Wolf and, and things like that. And I love the Faustian devil deals that people oh. <laughs> you know, find themselves into. And I always had a lot of fun when my players would find clever ways to outthink me and, mm -hmm you know, find something like that. So there we go. I guess that's my answer. Good answer. The Kickstarter's uh, still going on and um, this is your big project, but uh, what's next? So um, what's after this one is my sequel for my series. I write uh, a series called The Seventh Age uh, and it's an urban fantasy that's sarcastic. It's a joke about, it's what happens if magic returns back to today's world. So my joke is that it's sarcastic urban fantasy about the end of the world, right? If Voldemort won or if like uh, Dresden failed at uh, his job and all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the world around us blew up. I, I found a publisher for my sequel. So uh, with Prince of Cats Publishing and that is, it's already written, it's done, I gotta do it. And then after that though, I have been working on a project where I've been storytelling for kids for about two and a half years. And it's called the Storyteller's Forge. And what we've been doing is I've been running the store program at the local game store here, at, at, out here in Chicagoland. Uh, the store is called Fair Games. And we have this D&D for Kids program set up. And it started off small, but now I have 250 kids in the program. Yes. And we have, we have a bunch of GMs that storytell for them. And every act of the campaign that I've written they generally learn one aspect of how to become a storyteller, whether they're designing encounters, whether they're, you know, learning different like rules aspects and like how to research the monster manuals. Because at the end of the campaign, when they're done, those kids have built their own campaign world. And then they can take that and then go be storytellers for other people. And so I've already got my first draft of that one finished at like 85,000 words. And that's what I'm going to uh, focus on like that's gonna be my next game thing for sure is, is uh, bringing that one to life. okay so let, let's go over again with the details so this is right now kickstarter when does it end uh it ends on september 30th so uh it, it, it's going on right now ends on september 30th i think we just hit our next stretch goal and we're trying to unlock the next one which is a adventure called a stranger in Tatter tatters it is written by um, uh, my good friend, Michael. Uh, he's, you know, kind of associated with Epic Games. He, you know, the Dragon Thrones, uh, you know, type LARPs. And this adventure will feature a, like, new subclass where you're a, a warlock who kind of dabbles into a bit of bardic, like, the world is your stage and, like, marionettes <laughs> and, and plays from a very eldritch horror type aspect. It's kind of inspired by the King in Yellow, that HP, you know, that, that old, you know, right, HP Lovecraft right. story. Yep. So that's our current stretch goal. And we are excited as hell to unlock it. Because one thing that we're doing that I actually, here's one thing I'm really proud of. <laughs> in our campaign, we have additional warlock classes and additional things for players to get. Even if you're not a warlock, you could go do these side quests. And if your group does it, you might get access to some of these powers oh. uh, temporarily. <laughs> and the way it's intended is normally the, the rules and like these additional classes and stuff that you can play in these books, you can, you can start off the game that way. But since we wrote the module to either support high tier play, so you could run through it a bunch of level 20 characters or all level ones, our intent is, is that like a Final Fantasy, uh, like Final Fantasy VII, you would unlock these additional classes or these additional powers as you discovered or found them in the show. Ah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, I mean, of course, every storyteller can run their table and then like, screw it, my table's going to be a bunch of Evermore Warlocks from the start, but it's, <laughs> it's more fun if you have them unlocked mid-play. Sure, sure. Okay. And so, besides the Kickstarter, is there any other websites where, they can, where anyone can read more about this project? 
Uh, no, the Kickstarter page is absolutely the best place to go to it. You can download a sample of the first 33 pages of the book. You can listen to the music. You can see the beautiful artwork. Uh, everything that is on it, we've put all of our effort to making one of the best Kickstarter pages that you know we possibly could. And so that's the one spot we want people to go see because everything is there. We're posting all of our media outlets, even when uh, that stream I had done last night, uh, for example, um, will be like featured on there so people could like watch a live play session of it. So, excellent. So, uh, yes, uh, viewers, uh, we'll put the link in our description so you can go check out this Kickstarter. It, it, the art looks so fantastic. Uh, I can't wait to see this in my hands or at least on the screen. Um, uh, Thank you, everyone, and um, have yep. a great day. Take care.